Welcome everybody to the second half of the semester. Now that we've nailed down the fundamentals of celestial motions, gravity, and the behavior of light, we're well equipped to venture out into the universe and to learn about stars, galaxies, and the large-scale structure of the universe. As we move into our unit on stars, let's take a moment to define what we mean by star. What is a star? What distinguishes it from smaller objects like planets? To understand the differences, I think it's important to start with an understanding of the diversity of objects that the universe creates. So let's take a few minutes to outline a taxonomy or classification scheme for objects in the universe according to their size. The smallest things that we care about in this census of objects in the universe are individual particles of gas and dust in something called the interstellar medium which is a catch-all term for all of the material that exists between stars, and which we'll talk about in much greater detail in later lectures. Although they are very small, these particles will play an important role in the formation of stars and planets. They glom together into pebbles and boulders in the environment around young stars. Eventually, they make larger objects, asteroids and comets which have funny, lumpy shapes like potatoes because they don't have enough gravity to collapse into a compact, circular shape during formation. Once objects have enough self-gravity to achieve a circular shape, along with a couple of other important criteria, we call them planets. Planets can have sizes of up to 13 times the mass of Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, and still be called planets. At this size threshold, 13 Jupiter masses, something important happens. An episode of nuclear fusion is ignited in their densest regions, their cores. This episode is brief, lasting just about 10 million years, a blink of an eye in cosmic time. Objects at the low end of the mass scale, with masses near the threshold between 13 and about 75 Jupiter masses, are not able to sustain fusion for longer than this. And once it stops, these objects simply cool for the remainder of their days. They're not quite planets, but not quite stars either. And for this reason, they're called brown dwarfs. One might think of them as failed stars. In order to be a star, an object has to be big enough to sustain nuclear fusion in its core. The tremendous amount of energy generated in this process eventually escapes the star in the form of light. That's the first important thing to know about stars. They shine, or emit light. For long periods, too, generally billions of years. As we learned in the last unit, hot, dense objects like stars, so-called black bodies, emit light of all wavelengths, or colors. But the wavelengths where they emit most of their light, the peaks of their spectra, are determined by their temperature. Some stars, those with temperatures close to the sun, emit most of their light in the visible. Stars smaller and cooler than the sun emit most of their light at longer wavelengths, in the infrared. Stars bigger and hotter than the sun emit most of their light at shorter wavelengths, in the UV and X-ray. There's a limit to how big a star can be, too, but we'll talk about that a bit later. To understand stars, we first need to understand the process that makes them stars, nuclear fusion. Fusion is the merging of two small atoms into one larger atom. The vast, vast majority of the universe, 91% of all normal matter, is made of just one element out of all the elements in the periodic table. And in the very early universe, this proportion was even higher, about 98%. The domination of hydrogen in the universe is decreasing with time. It's being diluted by other elements, all of the other elements in the periodic table. How are these other elements made? Well, fusion is one of the primary ways, and we'll talk about some of the others in later lectures. In order to understand fusion, you need to understand a bit more about atomic structure. So let me just remind you of something that I'm sure you learned at some point in your education, but may have forgotten since then. There are three different types of particles that make up atoms. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. 
Protons are massive, positively charged particles. Massive, that is, compared to the negatively charged electron. Protons actually have a very small mass, 2 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, or 0.0000000000000000000002 kilograms. But electrons have a mass of 9 times 10 to the negative 31, or 0. 9 times 10 to the negative 31, or 0 0.0000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
which is less exotic than it sounds and not too important for our purposes here because it almost immediately finds its antiparticle, an electron, and annihilates with it, generating light. The other particle that is created is called a neutrino, which will become quite important later. What you're left with then is a nucleus with one proton and one neutron. Since it still has only one proton, it's still hydrogen, but unlike ordinary hydrogen, it now has a neutron in its nucleus as well. This neutron makes the form of hydrogen heavier, so we give it an alternate name, deuterium. Although again, remember that it's just a rare form of hydrogen. Atoms like this, with the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons, are called isotopes. Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. Because none of this is happening in isolation, this newly created deuterium atom is still swimming in a sea of ordinary hydrogen nuclei. When one hits the deuterium atom, they combine to form a nucleus with two protons and one neutron. Since the atom now has two protons, it's no longer hydrogen, but helium, a form of helium called helium-3 because it has three particles in its nucleus, two protons, one neutron. In this process, more energy is released, this time in the form of light. Eventually, this helium-3 nucleus will encounter another helium-3 nucleus, and these two will combine. In the process of fusing helium-3 nuclei together, energy will be released in the form of two individual hydrogen nuclei kicked out during the collision, and the end product will be a single nucleus of helium-4. This is the most common form of helium, which has two protons and two neutrons in its nucleus. And the reaction stops here because the temperature at the center of our sun is not hot enough to crash two helium-4 nuclei into one another. Although such processes will become important later when we talk about bigger stars and dying stars. That was a lot to take in, so let's look at this again pictorially to summarize. In a sea of protons, hydrogen nuclei, two find one another. As they stick together, one of them becomes a neutron, creating a deuterium atom, an isotope of hydrogen. A positron and a neutrino are released in the process. When the deuterium atom collides with another proton, it creates a helium-3 nucleus, and light is emitted. Meanwhile, this whole process is being repeated elsewhere in the cloud of hydrogen, making other helium-3 nuclei. When two helium-3 nuclei collide, they create a nucleus of ordinary helium-4, and two protons are ejected. Pictured in this sense, it's easier to get a feel for the so-called net reaction, which is the total number of things going in, reactants, and coming out, products, after the whole process is complete. One, two, three, four, five, six protons go into this process, and one, two, come out again. So in total, four protons are used up. One nucleus of he helium-4, two photons of light, two positrons, and two neutrinos are created. The net reaction is that four protons become one helium nucle nucleus plus some excess energy released in the form of photons, neutrinos, and positrons. The most important thing that happened in this process, from the perspective of trying to understand how a star works, are that A. Hydrogen has been turned into helium, a new element has been created, and B. In the process of creating helium, lots of energy was released in the form of a few different types of particles, including light and neutrinos. The light will eventually escape the sun, though the process is a bit convoluted. We'll do an exercise in class to calculate just how long this takes. The neutrino, however, is a strange kind of particle that doesn't interact very frequently with matter. Lots and lots of them are generated by the sun every second. In fact, even 93 million miles away from the sun as we are right now on Earth, there are 10 to the 10th power or 10 billion solar neutrinos flying through every square centimeter of the Earth. That means that there are literally trillions of neutrinos flying through your body right now and you don't even notice them. In fact, most neutrinos fly right out of the sun through the Earth and right on into the universe without once interacting with another particle. 
They stream right through most everything, even if it isn't, as if it isn't, isn't even there. But every once in a blue moon, which by the way is an interesting phrase that we can talk about in class sometime if you're interested, a neutrino will interact with a particle of matter. Here on Earth, physicists have been trying to detect solar neutrinos for a long time, with some success. To detect them, we have to bury our detectors deep under the Earth, where no more conventional particles can penetrate, things like protons and electrons. We bury huge vats of what's essentially cleaning fluid in abandoned mine shafts and line them with photodetectors, which can detect the tiny flash of light that's produced when that exceptionally rare neutrino interacts with a particle in the cleaning solution. In this picture, you see a crew at the Kamiokande neutrino detector in Japan, clearing, cleaning all of the photodetectors. The reason we try to detect neutrinos is because our understanding of fusion comes mainly from mathematics and our understanding of the physical laws of the universe. We can't make a mini-sun here on Earth to test our theory, and we can't burrow into the center of the sun to observe fusion happening there either. But we can make predictions about the number of neutrinos that we should detect in our giant vats of cleaning fluid based on our understanding of how nuclear fusion works in the sun, as well as how frequently a neutrino will react with matter, to predict how many flashes we should see. This acts as a test of whether we have our assumptions about fusion and the behavior of the neutrino right. So neutrinos can help us validate that nuclear fusion is really what's going on in the sun. But of course, the light that's created during the fusion process is probably the most important thing about fusion, particularly for life on Earth. Fusion is what causes stars to shine. If you've been thinking carefully about what I've been telling you so far, you may have realized that the fusion process going on at the center of the sun is like a giant bomb, much more powerful than any explosion we can create on Earth. So why doesn't the sun blow itself apart? The answer, like so many other fundamental questions about the universe, goes back to gravity. In fact, if we had started by talking about gravity, we might have asked this question in the opposite way, and here's why. The sun is a giant collection of matter, concentrated in a fairly small area. The fundamentals of gravity tell us that every massive particle attracts every other massive particle, tending to bring them together until something pushes it back against this tendency to collapse. There are several different ways that this pushback can be accomplished, and in the case of the sun, fusion is exactly what's needed. A star needs to be fusing in its core in order for the star to have a precise balance between gravity pushing inward, tending to cause it to collapse in on itself, and pressure from nuclear fusion pushing outward, tending to cause the star to blow apart. If the two are in precise balance, a precise balance called hydrostatic equilibrium, then neither one is winning. The star is neither collapsing nor being blown apart. It's stable. Now before we talk about more about the, how the sun works, I need to explain a few things about how heat is transferred from one place to another. First, let me remind you that temperature is essentially motion the motion of the atoms and molecules that make something up. Hot things have molecules that are moving fast, and cold things have molecules that are moving slow. Heat, on the other hand, is a form of energy, and it tends to move from warm regions to cold. In fact, the natural tendency of all objects in the universe is to equilibrate, to move hot to cold until everything is the same temperature. The universe would like to be homogeneous, to have the same temperature everywhere, and things like stars, planets, and people require heat generation and trapping in order to remain warm. We need energy to do it. In the sun, this energy comes from nuclear fusion. On Earth, it comes from leftover heat trapped inside of the Earth when it was forming, and also from sunlight intercepted and trapped by the Earth's atmosphere. In people, well, our energy source is food, of course. Heat can be moved from one place to another in three ways. The simplest is through direct contact of a warm object with a cooler one. If you've ever unthinkingly picked up a pot with metal handles from the stove, for example, then you might know about this mechanism for transferring heat. In fact, 
whenever you touch something hot and burn yourself, that's actually what's ap- actually happening is heat being transferred on a molecular level. The molecules that make up the hot object are moving fast because, again, that's what hot means, fast-moving molecules. The molecule in your hand, the molecules in your hand are moving slower because they're cooler. Molecules in the pot handle collide with molecules in your cool hand and speed them up when you touch it. Your hand becomes hot through direct contact with the pot handle. This process of direct contact, moving hot to cold, is called conduction. If you consider a pot of boiling water on the stove, conduction is also partly responsible for heating the water. The heating element is in contact with the pot, and its molecules collide with the pot molecules and speed them up. The molecules in the pot are in direct contact with water molecules at the bottom of the pot. They transfer some of their energy to water molecules, and these water molecules collide with other water molecules and spread the heat energy toward the center. You could imagine this process continuing to molecules farther and farther away from direct contact with the pot. If this were the case, when the water in the middle the water in the middle of the surface would be cooler than water at its edges. If you've ever stuck your finger in a boiling pot of water, though, something I don't recommend, you know that this is not the case. In reality, liquids like water are able to transfer heat in a much faster way than direct collisions, called convection. In convection, hot water at the bottom of the pot is exchanged with cold water at the top. The hot material at the bottom physically floats upward and cold material sinks, creating little currents that move water around and equalize its temperature. This is what is happening when you see water boil. The final way to transfer heat is through a process called radiation. If you were to leave the burner on your stove on, another thing that I don't recommend, you could imagine that it would heat the whole room over time. Some of this would be due to conduction between air molecules and the heating element. A little of it would be due to convection in the air, but mostly it would be due to radiation. As we learned in the last unit, excited atoms don't have to collide with other atoms in order to release energy. They can also generate photons of light and release energy that way. These photons of light leave the warm object and travel at the speed of light until they encounter something that can absorb them, another atom or molecule. The photon therefore acts as a carrier of energy from one place to another. It's another way to transfer heat. Hot, dense objects like the sun, or the heating element, actually give off light of all colors, blackbody spectra, that peak at shorter and shorter wavelengths as they get hotter. Your heating element, though hot, is nowhere near as hot as the sun, which peaks at visible wavelengths. It therefore peaks in the infrared range, which means most of its energy comes out there. If you turn off the lights and look at something really hot, why does it look red then? Well, look at the spectrum. The peak of the emission of the object might be in the infrared, but it gives off light at all colors, including some visible light. Since the peak is in the infrared, that means that the spectrum is sloping upward through the visible range. It gives off proportionally more red light than blue. So it looks red to your eye. The sun transfers heat in a couple of different ways according to the region. Although it looks pretty homogeneous from the outside, the sun has several different regions. Deep in its core is the only place where the temperatures and densities are high enough to sustain nuclear fusion. So the core is like the heart of the star. All of the energy generated by fusion and the source of the pressure that keeps it in hydrostatic equilibrium is here. The energy released by fusion is released in the form of photons, and the heat propagates slowly outward via radiation. Slow because a photon of light doesn't travel very far in the hot, dense sun before it encounters another atom and gets reabsorbed and emitted in a random direction. This means that photons escaping the core of the sun follow a slow, convoluted path called a random walk being absorbed and re-emitted many, many times along the way. The upper layers of the sun are convective, which means that once heat makes it up to a certain layer of the sun, it reaches a point where the material can boil. Hot inner material is carried upward to cool at the surface, and it's then carried back down again. 
How does it cool at the surface? It radiates. The light is now emitted in a much less dense region, and so it can travel fairly freely from the star. Except, of course, that some very specific colors are intercepted by atoms in the cooler upper layers of the sun, creating an, abs an absorption spectrum. We know this happens partly because we can see it. When we look very closely at the surface of the sun, we see that it's boiling like a pot of water. Once light leaves the sun, it can travel freely through the universe. Unless, of course, it gets intercepted by something else out there, like the Earth or an alien spaceship. Radiation is therefore the fastest and most important means of moving heat from one place to another in the universe. Since the universe is mostly empty space, heat transfer mechanisms like conduction and convection that require collisions and motion of matter can't move heat very far or very quickly. But radiation, light, travels fast, faster than anything else we know of, and it doesn't require the presence of matter. It is perfectly happy to travel through empty space forever, or until it encounters a distant atom. Heat is not the only important thing that the sun generates, though. It's worth reiterating that fusion also turns one element, hydrogen, into another. This is why the amount of hydrogen in the universe has been diluted with time, as I mentioned earlier in the lecture, because some of it is being transformed into helium in the core of stars. The helium that exists on Earth was made in the cores of a generation of stars that lived and died before our sun. Helium, interestingly, is a fairly rare resource on Earth and a non-renewable one. Because they are both very light, they're, because they're both very light in their gaseous form, most of the hydrogen and helium that existed in the Earth's early atmosphere escaped early during the lifetime of the Earth. Hydrogen is incorporated fairly freely into molecules, so a lot of it exists in other forms, like H2O, or water, for instance, which contains two hydrogen atoms. But helium is an inert gas that's not incorporated into molecules. It's so rare on Earth that nobody even knew helium existed until looking at the spectrum of the sun. When people studied the absorption lines in the solar atmosphere, they generally corresponded to the fingerprints of elements that had been studied here on Earth, things like sodium, carbon, p potassium, etc. But there was a set of lines that didn't correspond to any element known at the time, and these turned out to be helium. Thus, the existence of helium was predicted by looking at the spectrum of the sun and identifying an atomic fingerprint that had not yet been seen here on Earth. This transforming of one element into another also means that the region of the sun that's dense enough to sustain hydrogen fusion, the core, is slowly running out of fuel, hydrogen, as it's converted into helium. Eventually the sun will run out and a number of exciting things will happen that we'll cover in future lectures. All stars have a finite lifetime that's determined primarily by their size and the effect of size on lifetime is a bit counterintuitive. Big stars have a large region that's hot enough for fusion, and therefore a lot of fuel, but this also makes the rate of fusion reactions at their cores very high, and they burn through their fuel quickly. Small stars have comparatively small fusion reservoir, fuel reservoirs, but they burn through them slowly, very, very slowly for the smallest stars. In fact, the first generation of very, very small stars that were created in the universe may still be burning today. To remember this effect, I often think of stars as being like people. Rock stars are big and bright, but they live fast and hard and burn out young. Small stars are like hoarders. They save up everything they can and never run out, so they live for a long time. This is also the reason why there's an upper limit on the size of stars. The bigger our star is, the shorter it lives. There's a point where a star would be so big, it would essentially burn up all of its fuel in one shot. This is probably somewhere around 150 times the mass of the sun. Let me conclude by summarizing what we've discussed in this lecture. Stars fuse, which is what distinguishes them from objects like planets. They fuse hydrogen in a sustained way for hundreds of millions to billions of years, which distinguishes them from brown dwarfs. This sustained fusion supports them against gravitational collapse. In fact, Stars exist in a precise balance between gravity trying to collapse them and pressure from fusion trying to blow them apart. 
This balance is called hydrostatic equilibrium. The energy generated by fusion makes its way out of the star through radiation, and then conduction, and then radiation again. A small portion of the total number of photons of light escaping the sun are intercepted by us here on Earth, and they provide the main source of energy that sustains life on Earth and keeps our planet from cooling to be the same temperature as empty space.